the one thing I've said, and I'll stand by this, is that the world has not seen America really and truly angry since 1945. 1945 was the last time this country was all the way angry. And we know this is true because we built fleets of bombers and we destroyed entire cities. We didn't think twice about it. We firebombed Tokyo. Uh, the atomic bombs, The if you look on the map, the amount of damage done by the nuclear explosions at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and you compare those little, call those, let's say those little things a little purple radius, and you compare them with the red radius of all of the cities of Japan combined that firebombing has done, I don't even think you can see the purple radius. They simply just were not a significant contribution, basically, to what was already happening. But... Um, we firebombed Japan into submission, did the same in Germany as well. That was the last time we were all the way angry. And then I think that's when the RK shift started to happen. Uh, and so the question becomes, what would the history of the, of, of the world look like if somebody like Patton had had influence? If, if we hadn't gone so far, if we'd stayed more K. Um, I think looking at the little beats of history, what do we have? Stalin basically took over half the world, the whole Iron Curtain, the whole Soviet occupation of Hungary and Poland and Czechoslovakia, all of this stuff, um, was a result of him thinking that he'd won World War II single-handedly. They did an awful lot of winning World War II. But because Roosevelt and Eisenhower stopped Patton from taking Berlin, they thought that the West was weak. Uh, not only did they stop, not only did we stop ourselves from taking Berlin, we stopped ourselves from taking Vienna. Churchill was ready to go up the Aegean, up the Danube. He was going to take Vienna. He was going to take all of the Eastern European capitals. They would have been Western capitals. There would not have been a Cold War. There would not have been an Iron Curtain. It would have been Russia versus Europe and America. But we stopped. So what would have happened if we didn't stop? Well, if we had allowed George Patton to go, this is just speculation, but I, I think this is, I think this is without, I don't think there's much question about what I'm about to say. If I could have rewritten history, let me put it to you this way. Here's what I would have done. I would not have stopped Patton. I would have let Patton go and I would have put everything I had behind Patton. I would have had, I would have had the war end and the Russians and the Americans shake hand as far east as possible instead of what we actually did, which was have them shake hands as far west as possible. Which means that all of those, there would have been no East Germany, there would have been no East Berlin, there wouldn't have been a, 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 a Russian occupied Poland, there wouldn't have been a Russian occupied Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, none of it. We would have just pushed Western armies to the borders. The Germans would have surrendered to us. We know that they wanted to surrender to us. Entire units went hundreds of miles and individual citizens walked for hundreds of miles just so they could surrender to us. So this isn't stretch on my part. It's not like it was the other way around. It's not people, the Germans wanted to surrender to the West, so we could have pushed as hard as we wanted to, and, and we would have put that boundary between us and the, and the communists a lot farther east, a lot farther east than it was. But that's just the beginning of the issue, because Stalin understood that since we withheld our might, there was something wrong with us. From his point of view, there was something wrong with us. He thought we were weak and, and silly. And so what do we see after, after um, all the 40s? And the Ber there would have been no Berlin airlift. There would have been no Cuban Missile Crisis because it never would have gotten to the point of the Cuban Missile Crisis for reasons I'm about to elucidate. When North Korea invent invaded South Korea, we found the United Nations found themselves at war with communism. And in a world that I would have preferred to live in, a world that would have, saved, would have saved hundreds of millions of lives, not just a few people's lives, saved lives, I would have stabilized the situation the way that we did. I would have done the Inchon landing and all of that brilliance. And once I had the situation stabilized, and once we'd pushed the North Koreans back to the boundaries of North Korea, when the Chinese came into the Korean War, and that Chinese wave pushed the Americans back again, in my opinion, as a student of history, that's when history turned. That's when history turned. When, when Truman said to um, MacArthur, we're not going to use nuclear weapons against the Chinese because we don't want to start a nuclear war with the Russians who at that time may have had a bomb or two. We had 25 or 30. We had entire air forces. We had the most powerful navy in the world. We had fighter jets. We had everything. You know, war with Russia was, out, was laughable. It was hysterical. If it had been me running the presidency throughout the history since 
the end of World War II. I would have ended World War II as far east as possible. When the Chinese launched that invasion of North Korea, I would have done what MacArthur wanted to do. I would have put nuclear weapons on a frozen wasteland on enemy military targets. I would have used nuclear weapons to stop massed Chinese assaults. China didn't have any nuclear weapons. The UN sanctioned the Korean War. They sanctioned the American position, the Western position, the Korean War. North Korea was aggressors in that war, not us. No one would have done boo about it. Would have done boo. And we're not talking about these giant H-bomb city killers either. We would have used tactical nuclear weapons against massed Chinese formations. And if we had done that, if we had done that, then I don't believe there would have been a Vietnam. I just don't believe there would have been a Vietnam. You know why? Because the communists would have realized that the West believed in itself and thought there was something worth fighting for. They would have said, my God, these most powerful people in the world actually believe in their civilization, they believe in their own culture, and they are prepared to fight for it, and we can't match these people. We can't possibly match these people. We're not going to fight them. That would have been the end of the Korean War, and I think it would have been the end of the Vietnam War without the Vietnam War ever having been fought. But let's say that the Vietnam War was, in fact, fought. Let's say after putting nuclear weapons on, uh, on again, I'm not talking about bombing Beijing here. I'm talking about putting tactical nuclear weapons on military units in Korea. Let's say that we did that, and let's just say that they decided, well, maybe they were just kidding, and they'd started the Vietnamese War. From the beginning of the war in Vietnam, uh, Lyndon Johnson was fighting an R-type war. He was fighting an R war, a war of attrition, a war that culls our warriors. We have, we, by 1964, we were no longer the same country that we were in 1944. We weren't the same country in 1954. Something happened between 45 and 55. That's when it happened. By 1965, we're in Vietnam. What was Johnson doing? Johnson was personally in the basement of the White House picking bombing targets, determining the ingress and egress routes of strike packages. He was basically telling American pilots, you're going to have to overfly Haiphong Harbor, and as you come feet dry over the, over the shoreline to hit your targets in northern uh, uh, Vietnam, North Vietnam, you're going to get to look down at the ships, at the Russian ships that are unloading the SAMs that are going to shoot you down and kill you. You get to watch them, take them off the boat. You get, to, you get to fly over them in your A4s and your, and your, uh, you know, your intruders and your, and your Sky Raiders. You get to look down and watch them unload the SAMs off of those Russian tri uh, ships in that harbor that are going to shoot you and your buddies down. And so then Johnson would bomb North uh, Vietnam. He'd bomb Hanoi. But he'd bomb them for a little while, then he'd stop. Why would you stop? Johnson stopped because he wanted to make it look like a gesture of goodwill. See, this is the part I don't understand. You're at war with the country, you're bombing their cities. And now you're going to stop bombing for a while as a gesture of goodwill in order to do what? Once these people saw how Johnson was fighting the Vietnam, the Vietnam War, they said, they're insane. And as the war dragged on, because there's a lot of support for the war in the early part of the war, you know, right up until Tet, we never, ever put our full force into that theater because if we had, that war would have been over very, very quickly. Even as late as 1972, Creighton Abrams, when he, he took over from Westmoreland a little bit before the end of the, of, uh, before our ignominious departure from the Vietnam War. But Creighton Abrams basically said, we've been fighting a war of attrition. Think about that. We're trading American kids for Vietnamese kids, for Asian kids. That just doesn't make any sense mathematically. Forget about whose team you're on and forget about this whole business uh, of this being your kids and your children and people trying to protect. It's also kind of a little bit goes to the issue that the Victorians had when they were fighting these bush wars all over the place. Of Victoria, I think during Victoria's reign, I think the British went to war. I, I want to say it was 72 different individual, uh, not just engagements, 72 different individual little mini wars and police actions and so on during the reign of Victoria. Something like that, some incredible number. And, and Kipling wrote a little poem where he basically said, here's a, here's a, a British officer with, you know, 5,000 pounds of, of 5,000 pounds sterling of training and education. He went to Oxford. He speaks Latin and Greeks. He can do calculus on the back of a notebook. Here's a man who understands astronomy, physics. He understands biology. He's, he collects butterflies in his spare time. This guy's an incredible education. This guy with a, with a 5,000 pound education is killed by a guy with a 10 rupee spear, you know? 
so you don't so why we would get into a war of attrition when we've got supersonic jet fighters against people who essentially had bamboo spears is a bit of a mystery to me and that's the first part of it and then the second part of it is if you're going to put your people at risk you need to get this thing over with and Creighton Abrams had a plan where he basically said, I don't need more troops, Mr. President. I don't need wonder weapons. I don't need anything. We got enough guys in theater, more than enough guys in theater right now. Instead of us taking a hill, taking our losses, retreating, letting the VC or the, or the NBA take the hill, and then go take the hill again. We're going to stop this bullshit right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to take an armored column. We're going to march right up the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We're just going to take American armor with American air cover and American infantry, and we are going to go right up their supply route. We're just going to back them right up, right up. We're going to cross into North Vietnam, and then we're going to put these tanks in the center of the town square at Hanoi, Hanoi which is precisely what um, what they did in the Iraq war. And it would have been over in six weeks. It would have been over in six weeks. We didn't get that, but we got something like that because all of a sudden Nixon says, well, I want this war over. I want it to end. So what did he do? He started bombing Hanoi hard with B-52s. They came to the peace talk table within, what was it, 10 days, a week, two weeks? This, this, this peace talks that had been eluding Johnson for, for six years of this slaughter and this, and this carnage and, and tonight 17 American dead and 22 young men killed and Walter Cronkite reading off those figures. I remember my mom watching me watching tv and watching me i was probably 14 13 14 years old thinking uh, this isn't going to be good for bill in another five years uh no just go up there and stop it so nixon starts to bomb hanoi the north vietnamese come to the peace table and instead of instead of stopping yeah it was linebacker too dave uh, uh, instead of bombing them stopping bombing them stopping we kept bombing them until the until we had a, a peace agreement and then the war was over but again that war would never have happened if we'd used nuclear weapons against the Chinese. And if we were serious about winning the Vietnamese War, we would have. I'm, I'm not saying we should have nuked Hanoi. I'm not saying that was the thing to do. I got a chance to interview the guy who invented the, um, uh, the neutron bomb. He was a really interesting guy. A good man, too. I liked him very much. I got a chance to talk to him in the last year of his life. I spent hours and hours and hours at his house. And he basically said, look, this is what the neutron bomb was invented for. You could have put neutron bombs over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And yes, it's absolutely true. You would have killed a large number of North Vietnamese soldiers, but you wouldn't have killed two million of them. You wouldn't have killed a tenth of that. You wouldn't have killed a hundredth of that. You, might, you wouldn't have killed a thousandth of that. You would have just ended the war. And our job is not to protect their casualties, by the way. Our job is to protect our casualties. That's the American president's job, is not to protect uh, Vietnamese soldiers' lives. His job is to protect American soldiers' lives. A couple of neutron bombs down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and all of a sudden the war is over. And so once again, it's like these actions are not only effective, and they're not only good for us, and they're not only save American lives, but like the nuclear bombing of Japan, they save the lives of the Japanese, they save the lives of the Koreans, they save the lives of the Vietnamese by ending it, by ending it. And for those people out there who still think that it, America deserved to lose the Vietnamese War and that this whole thing was a catastrophe, uh, every now and then I'll go down to Target and I'll buy a pair of – I'll buy a package of uh, Hanes underwear. And I'll open that package up and I'll look on the inside and it will say, Made in Vietnam. So, we, so this whole thing happened for what? They're capitalists. They make money. They like making money. Their lives are improved by making money. And all of those millions of people who were executed after the war because they had the temerity to support America, that wouldn't happen if I'd been running the thing either, if Patton had been running the thing, if Grant or somebody like that, General Grant, General, uh, President Lincoln, as an example. Lincoln put his full forces into the field. Lincoln, whatever faults you may have with Lincoln, I know a lot of people who fear big government have a lot of problems with Abraham Lincoln, but put that aside for a minute. If you look at Lincoln as a war president, Abraham Lincoln put everything he had into the field at all times. And Lincoln aged 20 years in four years, not because he was doing the Johnson thing, oh, well, we'll hit him and then we'll pause and we'll show him some goodwill. Lincoln aged 20 years in four years because Lincoln could not find a general who would who would take the armies that he had in barracks to war. We won the Vietnamese War. 
we never lost on the battlefield in that war. Every time we had an objective, we took it. And by the time the ceasefire was over, when we stopped shooting, what was the situation? Was Hanoi running uh, the, the flag of North Vietnam? No. The war ended when America left. The war ended with the boundaries where they were at the beginning. And it was only two, three years after we left at combat operations that the U.S. Congress sold out support to the, North Vietnamese, uh, to the South Vietnamese government. And then they just rolled in. They just bided their time and waited. That never would have happened if we had been serious about fighting. So here's the point I'm going to close with about all this stuff. People think that by not fighting, by running away and by doing limited warfare, by not using nukes on the Chinese army as they invaded North Korea on behalf of the North Koreans who started the whole thing in the first place, by not using a couple of nuclear weapons there, we were not being kind and we were not being decent and we were not showing how civilized we were. We were doing just exactly the opposite. We were proving to them that we weren't willing to fight for what we believed in and what should have been a war that might have lasted two or three months if we'd put in our full force in Korea ended up taking two or three, three or four years, whatever it was. A war in Vietnam that should have lasted a year, top end to get everything in theater and held our guys back at the bases until we're ready to go. You march them up the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You use what we're good at. We've got tanks. We have jet aircraft. Push them up the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Put a couple of, of uh, neutron bombs on the trail ahead of us to get some of those troops out of the way. That war would have been over in a year. Instead of losing 50,000 people, we would have lost 500 people. And instead of the uh, Vietnamese losing, God knows how many they lost, four. 2 million, 3 million, 4 million civilians, the NVA would have lost 20,000, 50,000 casualties. We would have saved enormous amounts of lives, their lives as well as ours, although I don't think we're responsible for saving their lives. But that's what would have happened. 